the vast mammoth steppe of the Pleistocene era. Woolly mammoths, now long extinct, once roamed these northern landscapes in large herds, playing a critical role in the stability of their ecosystem. In the last half century, however, these permafrost regions have begun to thaw at an alarming rate due to climate change and the loss of this keystone species. Over the last decade, humanity has made significant advances in understanding DNA and the field of genetics. Breakthrough genetic engineering technologies like CRISPR and others have made it possible to read, edit and even write genomes. Combining these modern genetic engineering technologies with ancient mammoth DNA recovered from frozen specimens allows for the de-extinction of the woolly mammoth genome. Reintroducing the woolly mammoth to their former homes in the Arctic regions will help to bring balance back to the habitat and slow or even reverse the damage that climate change has done to our planet. Colossal. Restoring the past for a better future. And uh, now I would like to introduce to the stage two of the principles involved in this amazing technology of de-extinction. First is Ben Lamb. He's the CEO and founder of Colossal. He's a fellow entrepreneur from Texas that I've known for many years and uh, has had great successes, as well as uh, Ariana Hisoli, who's head of the biological sciences at Colossal and is really doing probably the heavy lifting in bringing back extinct species. I'm going to let them uh, speak at the podium here for 15, 20 minutes. Uh, and then we're actually going to sit down, have a little conversation, and you will get a chance to ask some questions too if you would like. So think about your questions as they do their initial presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Richard. Mm -hmm. I'm Ben, and this is Ariana. And uh, I think Ken couldn't have done a better job telling you about how everything's going to die in extinction. And then we're going to tell you that we think we can go the other way. So this journey started uh, actually about 10,000 years ago. I started working on it about six years ago, about four years ago. Ariana started working on it, what, seven years ago with George. And uh, it's been a whole like cast of characters that have really been involved in, the, uh, um, in, in this event. One is, uh, you know, obviously the incredible scientist, Russian scientist, uh, Sergei Nikita Zimov, uh, from Ben Meserich, who's been like chronicling the whole thing, uh, to George Church, uh, to, to uh, Ryan Phelan and, and Stuart Brand, from Revive and Restore, there's just been an incredible movement around the de about what's possible using genetic rescue in, in de-extinction. And so uh, I mentioned George, and I think uh, Richard definitely mentioned George briefly earlier, but George, if you don't know him, he's the father of synthetic biology, the lead uh, geneticist at Harvard University, and he's the one that really, I guess, took the, you know, the, the, the opportunity to bring all these people together and really start the movement of bringing back the woolly mammoth for the purposes of Arctic rewilding. And, and, and if I could throw in a comment here, Ben, as, as we discussed, uh, uh, it, I just find it interesting to note uh, that my wife, Leticia, uh, we happen to be investors in SpaceX, and my, my wife was with Elon Musk uh, about uh, 10 years ago, seven, eight, 10 years ago, uh, and said, hey, Elon, you know, we're big fans of you. Who is the one person on Earth that we should talk to other than you about the future who's gonna really change the world coming going forward? And he mentioned one name, and that one name was George Church. So, we also had gone out about the same time to go visit George Church, and obviously we were very excited when these guys uh, got together and, and started Colossal. Yeah, and, and George is amazing. If you don't know George, he's not only a genius, he's also super interesting, funny, and kind of weird. Um, <laughs> and so he's, he's awesome, he's just great. Uh, and he really, and so the momentum really started in 2013 uh, when, these, when, the, when this you know, a group of incredible folks came together and launched the first TEDx de-extinction event. And in that, in, in that kind of event, they had speakers you know, from a wide variety of species talking about the thylacine, the passenger pigeon, the dodo, and obviously George talked about the mammoth. But what was really clear about leaving uh, uh, the presentation from, from George was that every single person left and, and thought, wow, we actually have the technologies to do this. We have a purpose to do it for Arctic rewilding, and it really just needed focus and funding. And that really created an opportunity from filmmakers and others to start uh, uh, pouring resource dollars into uh, the research and helping them go on their first uh, adventure uh, uh, back to the Arctic uh, to Russia. 
And uh, this is essentially my journey to the extinction. I was uh, finalizing my program uh, in grad school, and I was looking at uh, various postdoc opportunities for me uh, when I was reading about George Church and his efforts for the extinction and how to do that through synthetic biology, and I was mesmerized. Uh, and uh, mammoths changed my life uh, afterward. So I got a chance to travel with him in 2018 to Siberia. Uh, we traveled across 14 time zones, 4,800 miles, um, and it was incredible. It was an incredible journey. We were there with a film crew. Um, we were there with Stuart Brandt, who's a writer, a conservationist, former editor of Whole Earth Catalog, and uh, founder of Long uh, Now Foundation. And he's an incredible figure. And um, the documentary was called We Are As Gods, uh, which we are not, but we are learning from the best, I guess. Uh, and we got the chance to meet the Zimovs, the Sergei and Nikita Zimov, who run the places and park uh, around Chersky. And uh, it was an incredible journey. They have been instrumental advocates of uh, returning to biodiversity on a mammoth steppe ecosystem. So uh, it was an incredible journey for me as well. And uh, you can see here George. Uh, George really reveled into uh, the discovery of the past. Uh, we Essentially, our work uh, has benefited a lot from the work of Yakutian scientists and mammoth tusk hunters who have found some of the best specimen out there. And here is shown, uh, we, so we took a lot of boat rides, uh, a lot of trips around places and park. We went into these ice caves that uh, locals use to store fish, but also for measurements, uh, scientists use for measurements for, for permafrost changes. And so um, we learned a lot, and I think uh, this particular journey uh, drew the attention of a, a lot of media. Uh, and, um, but more importantly for us, uh, we were actually um, uh, able to sample some of their best specimen, which is uh, shown in the next picture uh, as well. Um, I, this is me in a cold room, and George took a picture of me next to the skull of Obuli Mammoth. Um, these specimens were very, very well preserved. We were able to sample them. And the flesh was quite juicy, actually. But in this case, there was actual fur in the, in the room. And, and you can see the scale here. I, I, I think I cannot compete, I guess, there. So this was an, in, an incredible journey, an incredible experience for me. As I mentioned, it drew a lot of media attention. Um, and uh, we were also subject of a, a documentary on 60 Minutes, which is what uh, essentially uh, drew the attention of Ben, and it started the whole uh, colossal de extinction journey to actual de extinction uh, actualization. Yeah, and I, th I think Kent talked a little bit about the fate or the luck that humanity has with the with the asteroid impacts, but this was definitely fate. So I had been talking to George for I guess two or three months at the time. Uh, I'd been to the lab a few times. I, I literally got back and I was running a different company at the time, and I was like, "Can I go raise money for?" elephant conservation and de-extinction. And in that process, I got home, was starting to talk to my wife, and then I got this, uh, a, a random call, and it's like, I think the guy that you just met with is on 60, uh, 60 Minutes talking about mammoths. And so I turned on the TV, and sure enough, and this happened literally the day I got home. And so it was definitely a, um, a cosmic fate that, that I guess forced it. And that, that next morning, I, I uh, texted George and said, I'm in. Let's go figure out how we uh, uh, bring back a mammoth. So how do we get from extracted DNA to an actual living mammoth? And I think I have to say it's no easy task. It's no walk in places and park, by no means. But we start with uh, just a lot of specimen. Uh, and that includes living elephants as well as woolly mammals. And we have on the woolly mammal specimen alone over 50. And we continue to sequence uh, elephant specimen that we receive from our partners and collaborators. So we create this whole genome uh, uh, profiles of the specimen we have. We analyze them computationally. We tabulate all these results, especially focusing on the ones that are fixed. That means these DNA changes are, are different, and that what make uh, woolly mammals different from uh, their closest living relatives, which are uh, the elephants. And then we try to narrow down to a list that actually correlates with some of the phenotypes that give us the, the clear um, cold adaptation traits, such as a shaggy hair, um, dome-shaped uh, cranium, the, the, the curved tusks, cold temperature resistant and ta fat deposits. And what you do is you actually use cutting-edge uh, DNA editing technologies 
uh, that we've licensed and we work in collaboration with a, with a, a church lab in, uh, at Harvard. And we introduce these uh, components into the cells. We enrich, we screen cells, we use next generation sequencing technologies in order to actually make sure that their edits are correct. And then we get to the testing stage where we validate that these edits are associated with phenotypes ver through various functional assays. And then once we actually have validation at the cellular and animal uh, level, animal model level, then once we have those validation of the traits, we will move on to uh, uh, nuclear transfer, embryo generation, implantation into a surrogate, a healthy surrogate, and uh, the gestation. And of course, the early steps would be to use healthy surrogates, but what Colossal wants to do is move away from using endangered species uh, completely uh, for their conservation. And for that, which we'll be talking a little bit uh, about later, we'll be using in vitro gametogenesis and ex utero technologies. And one of the things, like you, you probably all heard the phrase, it takes a village to raise a child. It takes a lot more than a village. It takes a worldwide effort to uh, build a, a mammoth. And we're very, very grateful for our collaborators across the world. We've got incredible bioethicists, conservationists, um, uh, leading scientists in various fields. We have Richard. Um, and so we're very, very uh, grateful for it. And, and even we, in the last two days, uh, there's been several of you that I think may also join our scientific advisory board. So we're very grateful for you guys. And if there's anyone that after this presentation wants to talk about collaborating, it's really, really important. And just a key point on that that, that uh, I wanted to point out is like, you know, we're, we've done a lot, we have over 54 mammoth genomes in our possession. We think we have the largest set of, of, of sequence genomes in the world for, for mammoths. And that's come largely from uh, some of our excavations as well as our uh, partner collaborations. But we were planning to go back to Yakuts uh, this summer, and given the conflict that's happening right now uh, in, in Ukraine and Russia, that's, that's impossible. And so it's really the partners that have helped step in and, and help solve that. And so like when I gave some of this data to Richard, uh, Richard said, why don't you come to Alaska with us? Yeah, and in fact, for those of you who have, have been following uh, the club calendar, uh, we're gonna hold our next board meeting uh, in September up in Alaska. And so they've already actually been in touch with the folks that run a a site up there called the Boneyard, and the researchers up there that are pulling out woolly mammoths in Alaska, and are thinking of uh, rewilding. In, in fact, they've already had discussions have gone not only from an extraction standpoint, but all the way up to how can we help reintroduce the woolly mammoth, woolly mammoth back into the wild. So, uh, the club has, uh, and its utter membership is really already stepping in in, yeah, in a big we, way. We just couldn't be anywhere without our partner, so we are just super grateful. And then also our incredible team. So. Uh, in our eight months since launch, we've actually stood up three labs. We've hired 70 people. There's a, quite a, and we're hiring more, um, across everything from embryology and cloning all the way through uh, sequencing and uh, computational biology and then actually editing itself. And so we're very, very grateful to hire this incredible diverse team from across, <coughs> the, from across the world. And Ariana is going to talk a little bit about some of the major, there's a lot to cover in the science we don't have forever, but Ariana is going to cover some of the major things that we're working on um, on her team. Yes, let's get a little bit uh, deeper into the actual um, workflows that we use at Colossal. Uh, we start, of course, with the help from great partners and collaborators who share with us this very, very precious specimen uh, from uh, various uh, uh, elephants throughout the zoos, and so we have a combination, of course, of uh, male and female elephants, and uh, of course, African and uh, uh, Asian elephants. Those are the closest living, especially uh, Asian elephant, are the closest uh, uh, living relative to the woolly mammoth. But we're also interested in conservation, and so we would like to actually collect specimen and sequence uh, the other all existing uh, elephants. And in fact, we're uh, just from the previous slide, we are collaborating with the Vertebrate uh, Genome Project in order to sequence, make uh, telomere to telomere high quality reference uh, genomes for all existing elephant species, um, African, Asian, Bornean, and forest elephants. And so we, uh, we generate, we, we collect tissues, we derive the cell lines, and then we, uh, those are the, our input for our workflows, which is uh, they'll be edited, they'll be screened, they'll be sequenced, and then there'll be multiplex edited. So uh, this is an iterative cycle that we use in order to, uh, uh, to implement all the edits that we want. We also run kind of like a mini zoo, uh, at, a mini frozen zoo at Colossal, where we collect these specimens both for our extinction efforts and for conservation. So we start with tissues and we generate thriving, growing uh, uh, elephant cells that will be used for sequencing, as I mentioned, uh, our reference genome. Uh, work with the VGP, but as well as our editing work. 
Uh, this is an overview of the workflow of the editing. We use gene editing technologies, of course, not uh, only CRISPR-based, but mostly CRISPR and base editing-based. And we start with cells. We, we um, deliver the CRISPR or gene editing component. We screen these cells. We use next-generation uh, sequencing technologies after these cells have been enriched. Uh, that increases the, the efficiency of the editing uh, and, uh, an actual, um, uh, and, and making sure that there is an actual correct edit versus uh, um, screening for cells that have also off-target effects. So we would like to eliminate those from the population of desired uh, targets. And then we use uh, computational tools in order to analyze and screen the best cells we can get uh, with all the edits that we, uh, we desire. And what, one of the big things that we're, we're focusing on, because a lot of the team is also so, uh, some AI folks and some great engineers, is then how can we operationalize and systematize the process for de-extinction? And how can that also apply to human healthcare? So a lot of the great findings that we're getting out of this, we're now looking to apply to human healthcare, which we think is really fascinating. Uh, because we have such a uh, wealth of uh, genomic data, genomic sequencing data, we are not uh, finished with just uh, uh, that initial list of genes that we correlate with uh, cold adaptation traits. We have a whole proprietary discovery process where we actually look at other genes and other gene pathways that are responsible for these cold adaptation traits. And so we go through the cycle of analysis, computational, uh, uh, looking at the genomes, computational uh, analysis, uh, looking at the correlation with uh, potential traits, uh, and this, uh, for this particular discovery process, we really are thankful for our computational, our bioinformatics team, because they do an incredible job, not only analyzing, but also potentially building all the tools that are uh, needed to actually expedite and make this process more efficient. In, in uh, I guess you want to talk about the iPSC work. Yeah, and I mentioned uh, a little bit about our cell work, and. Uh, I briefly uh, alluded to uh, our in vitro uh, gametogenesis and ex, uh, ex utero development, but, for, for, but to develop those kind of uh, uh, functional assays with uh, these powerful cells that are called pluripotent stem cells, you need to actually derive the pluripotent stem cells, not just go and harvest them from the animal. And here, you probably have, some of you at least might have heard of uh, induced pluripotent stem cells, which are uh, very, very similar to uh, embryonic stem cells. Uh, in fact, I think they are evolutionized the, the field of um, uh, stem cell biology, but they've been uh, somewhat finicky and tricky to derive uh, uh, elephants, uh, iPS cells, and we have partially, uh, what we call partially reprogrammed because we are actually still characterizing the cells, uh, African elephant, but we, uh, no one has ever derived Asian elephant iPS cells, so this is, uh, we're very excited to show just uh, some promising uh, images of Asian uh, elephant iPS cells that will actually be crucial to our work for in vitro gametogenesis and functional assays. So very, very excited about this image. We're still characterizing and sequencing, uh, but hopefully that work will be completed in the next few months. <clears throat> this is the first time, as Ariana mentioned, that we've ever shown it outside the lab. It is my favorite slide in the deck just because the ramifications, not just for the Mammoth Project, are, are pretty impactful, but also how it can help for conservation. We're pretty excited. And so a little bit about, you know, why should we do this? Like, how does this help not just, you know, bring back the mammoths, which sounds cool and interesting, but why should we do this? How does this help elephants, and how does this help the, the, the broader kind of ecosystem? And so we're really kind of focused on three big areas as it relates to elephant conservation. One is uh, attacking different uh, issues that elephants are currently facing, uh, one being disease states. Two is Arctic rewilding. Uh, and then three is then building advanced gestational technologies, which we have the science to do. We just haven't had enough focus and funding and engineering support to really to make some of these breakthroughs that could be revolutionary for, for um, uh, species preservation. And so one of those is EEHV. Uh, I didn't know this until I started working uh, with George a few years ago on this, on this project, but EEHV is a herpes virus that kills about 25% of all Asian elephants, which are endangered at the time of weaning, when they're moving off their mother's milk. Um, and it's something that is curable, that we, we can create treatments. We are currently in the process of synthesizing the virus in our lab. We're currently doing work at Harvard. We're currently funding uh, some incredible work with uh, uh, Dr. Paul Ling at the Baylor College of Medicine around this. And we believe in the next you know, two to three years that we will either have uh, a cure or we'll have major therapeutics that could save elephants. And when an elephant gets EHV, especially in captivity, they typically die within 24 hours. And so it's, it's a terrible de de uh, deliberating disease. It's also uh, affecting both Asian elephants and African elephants uh, in, in captivity. And then in addition to that, Arctic rewilding is a second major tenet of, of what our long-term goals uh, with the project are. 
Yeah, uh, what excites me more is actually our conservation efforts. Um, but beyond that, at the macro scale, we look at what could the elephants reintroducing, rewilding, uh, do for uh, the environment. And we, of course, are inspired by uh, the work that's been done, uh, as I mentioned before, in Places and Park, this mini uh, geoengineering project, uh, where we try to keep the biomass that's deposited in this permafrost, uh, this organic uh, um, biomass layer that is actually going to, um, as, as, the, as the permafrost thaws, going to be released in the atmosphere in, uh, in the form of carbon dioxide and methane, which is uh, a very, very powerful greenhouse gas. So we want to keep these deposits uh, trapped where they are uh, supposed to be. And in order to do that, the reintroduction of this, uh, of the megafauna, because they supported such a rich, uh, diverse uh, ecosystem, the mammoth steppe ecosystem, we believe that reintroducing them would be able to actually combat mammoths uh, are pretty big. So we want to get rid of the coniferous trees. And, you know, as Ben likes to say, we're not against we're not trees. Not against trees. We're, we're against small, inefficient, slow-growing coniferous trees with dark bark that permeate, permeate heat in the permafrost. But the, the, yeah, but the shrubs and the taiga are very uh, slow carbon and nitrogen cycling, so uh, replacing them with a grassland ecosystem uh, actually is uh, more beneficial to supporting a more biodiverse uh, uh, life. And in addition to that, uh, the clearing of the, of the step, you can actually uh, grow more grassland uh, when, this, uh, when uh, during snowfall, uh, the light and heat is reflected back. So you see like there's a, a mitigation of the albedo effect. Uh, and uh, in addition, all the animals that you introduce into the park trample through the snow. The Zimovs uh, have peer-reviewed uh, work where they show that the surface layer of uh, Earth actually is uh, cooled by 2 to 10 degrees if there are larger animals that trample on the snow that actually make sure that the, the colder temperatures penetrate deeper. So all these are mitigating effects uh, for the environment. As I said, it's a great project in terms of when you look at the uh, conservation efforts, but also uh, down the line with potential at the macro scale with Arctic rewilding efforts. And then the last part, as it affects not just elephants, but you know, potentially all critically endangered species, is assisted reproductive technologies. Ultimately, you know, here's a, a render of an uh, artificial womb. We have a 20-person team that's working on ex utero development, uh, specifically focused on marsupials and, uh, and, and in mammoths. Uh, and, and in elephants. But, but I think from what you've heard a little bit of what we're working on, if you start to look at the gametogenesis and the stem cell reprogramming, the genetic rescue technologies, the great work that the VGP and other people are doing with sequencing, you combine that with uh, you know, technologies like artificial wombs and whatnot, you really are starting to get not just a de-extinction toolkit, but a species preservation toolkit that can be used across you know, a, a myriad of different species. And one like you know, really critical, critical uh, fact that we learned early on is that you know, uh, some, client, some of the models that we've seen is that we're going to lose up to 50% of all biodiversity between now and 2050. I think you've heard that from various different folks here in, in, in their different fields. Um, but I think that, that humanity does have the, the, the technology together to arm conservationists with new tools to, to uh, combat it. And I don't know if many of you have seen this photo. This is a picture of Sudan, the last male northern uh, white rhino that passed away a few years ago. Lucky enough for, for scientists and Dr. Hildebrandt and a few others that we collaborate, actually were able to uh, uh, get uh, sperm cells uh, from uh, Sudan and others before they passed away. And here's a picture of Najin and Fatu, the last two uh, northern white rhinos that are female. And so without genetic rescue, without you know, advanced, some of these advanced technologies that we're, that we're developing and that others are developing, uh, these, these animals are currently fun functionally extinct, and they will go extinct. But if we, if we can you know, build this uh, de-extinction toolkit on our path to the mammoth, you know, we think that we can help certain species like the northern white rhino grow 10 to 20 of them in a lab and then work with incredible conservation and rewilding experts to reintroduce them ethically back in, uh, in, into the world. And then um, you know, last but certainly not least, they're not alone. Um, it, it's constantly ex accelerating. I think everyone's seen what's happened in Australia in the last few years with climate change, with the wildfires, with the pictures of, of koalas. Now the Australian government's uh, devoting tens of millions of dollars every single year to protect habitat and, and protect a lot of their uh, uh, marsupial species. And then, you know, Lonesome George, the same uh, is becoming an iconic species, uh, iconic uh, member of the de-extinction club where, uh, you know, he went extinct in the Galapagos. And so this isn't just mammals that are being affected, this is all species. So, uh, so that's what we're working on. We're really excited about being on our path to de-extinction and then on our path to species preservation. All right, so you, first man. say thank you, if you would, to Ben and, and, and Ariana. Come around here. <clears throat>
And um, I'd like to start, we're just going to take a few minutes for questions. I know uh, we uh, are pushing close up here against uh, our lunch break. Um, but one of the things I want to start with, something we covered at South by Southwest, I had the uh, great uh, uh, pleasure to uh, speak with these two folks uh, just a few months ago at South by Southwest, when the company had only at that time been fewer months yeah, in existence. Yeah, four months old, yeah. Four months in existence. And even at that point, you showed a slide there that was a living cell that of the 50 or 60 genes that, rep that represent the primary differences from an Asian elephant to a woolly mammoth, you already had five or so of those genes being expressed in what was an Asian elephant cell. Uh, so to me, that just shows how fast this is proceeding. So give us the big beats from here to uh, at least an egg, because we know it's, we, you, you mentioned that it's a two-year gestation period. What are the big beats between here and an embryo? Uh, we want to get to a mammoth. <laughs> yeah, the biggest um, beat is yeah. mammoth, but yeah. yeah. Uh, but I think the, the progress uh, that we're making, uh, along with our um, collaborators at Harvard Medical School, is we really want to build on multiplex editing, push the limits on how many uh, edits you can make per one cell at different uh, loci, right? So there are, the Church Lab has, um, has uh, the record for a number of targets, over 13,000, but that's mostly for repetitive elements. But non-repetitive elements are still uh, a challenge uh, to multiplex edit, um, especially if you want to do multiple of those at the same time. So pushing the limits of multiplex editing, being able to differentiate into different lineages, derive these stem cells, the iPS cells that I, uh, I just mentioned, so we can actually derive gametes uh, from these animals. We don't have to go into uh, the actually endangered species to collect them. We can do that in vitro. Um, and, you know, the, uh, constant harvesting of eggs from uh, healthy surrogates actually uh, makes for fibrotic tissue uh, of the ovaries, which uh, induces non-reproductivity. -reproduct um, uh, and so being able to counter those challenge Challenges not only for our extinction work, but our, for our conservation is crucial. But even the, the egg harvesting and the nuclear transfer are going to be um, major milestones in uh, the elephant research community. And I think our target is uh, 20, 18 or 20 of the major edits this year. 20, 20 edits by the end yeah. of the year. Okay, 20 of 50 or 60. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and aggressive. by the way, I have a couple other questions myself, but if anybody else, uh, back here in the back on the right, you, 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 you two were up side by side, so either way. Hi, is this working? Yeah, this is working. You guys, I, I see that this, this type of technology has so much application to preventing extinction. I guess my question is a really big one about re resurrecting the mammoth. So the, eco the mammoth ecosystem has changed substantially over the last 10,000 years. So I guess my concern is like, have you, have you done any ecological, in-depth ecological modeling around what impact introducing the mammoth would have on the current ecosystem? Mm -hmm. And also given the fact that climate change is, you know, really impacting this ecosystem quickly, what impact is that gonna have on the reintroduction of the mammoth? It's a, it's a great question. I mean, there's, there's more uh, carbon and methane stored uh, in the Arctic, because unlike the tropics where there's a constant, you know, carbon nitri nitrogen cycle, uh, in, the, in the permafrost it just gets layered, right? And so the melting of the permafrost is a, is a pretty big issue. That's one of the reasons why George wanted to pursue the project um, uh, in, in, in the first place. And methane's about 30 times worse in the atmosphere than, than carbon. And so what we know about mammoths is they actually are, are pretty diverse, right? And so they were actually, there was different forms. There's the Columbian mammoths, the Arctic mammoths, Siberian mammoths, the Alaskan mammoths, and, and they could actually traverse a quite a large, uh, we find them everywhere, they, they traverse a, a, quite a large uh, range on, on the planet. Um, what we are using is the Asian elephant as kind of our architecture. Uh, and there's actually uh, zoos and whatnot in Canada that have Asian, and, and most people think of the Asian elephant as a tropical species, but they actually have Asian elephants out in, uh, uh, in, in, in outside of Toronto where they're playing in the snow, breaking through the ice and swimming in, in, these, in these ice frozen lakes and they, and they actually love it, right? And that's, that's without additional cold adaptation like uh, hemoglobin production, the hair, the extra fat layers, uh, uh, the trip V3, everything on the nerve ending. So without even all of those edits in, in, in just kind of a baseline Asian elephant, they are 
uh, pretty adaptable to, to, to that environment. We still have uh, parts of the Arctic that get to uh, similar temperatures, so negative 20 to negative 40 uh, is still pretty consistent up there. And our goal is the, the fact that you know, climate change is happening and that environment is changing is actually, I wouldn't say it's a, it's a negative, it is one of the reasons why we've been really focused on it and we've been collaborating as uh, Ariana mentioned with uh, Sergey and Nikita Zimov that have several decades uh, of data of showing about how permafrost rewilding using herbivores, how it actually works and how it can lower the temperature of the ground up to you know as far as 10 degrees, which is significantly higher than the, the tipping point that the world seems to be focused on, um, as well as um, you know how uh, 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 as well as some collaborators in Cambridge that are looking at just the broader Arctic Circle, and so we're constantly uh, looking at it um, and, and looking at the peer-reviewed published models around it. And uh, I, I know there's a bunch of more questions uh, on queue, but uh, I've been asked here to go ahead and wrap up because we're, we're pushing into lunch. And so we're gonna take the rest of the questions out there in the next room for these folks because we have one more thing we need to cover up here on the stage before Great. we release. So uh, at the beginning, you'll say thanks to these folks and they'll be ready for your questions outside in just yeah. a minute. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>